Welcome to today's session, everyone. We are PreMedCC, a student-led organization established in the fall of 2021. Our goal as an organization was to create an online program for pre-medical students at community colleges and universities with the hope of guiding the next generation of diverse and inclusive physicians. And while we advertise our organization as being for community college students, our events are open to anyone. We realize that finding guidance and mentorship in a pre-med journey can be especially challenging for first-generation pre-med students. People that lack the financial resources or just those who do not know people in the medical field. One of the best parts about our events is that they are virtual, so you can do it from the comfort of your own home. We typically have events on Fridays from 5 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and on Saturdays from 11 a.m. to 12.30 Pacific Standard Time. If you aren't able to attend the event, all of our sessions are uploaded on our YouTube channel. Many of our sessions will end up with a Q&A with the speakers. Any questions that you have, you may put it in the Q&A session on Zoom, and our team members will read them and have them answer. After you have attended our event, you can log into our website and complete the quiz, which will contain questions pertaining to our session today. If you score 70% or higher on the quiz, you will be awarded a certificate to show that you attended our session today. If you want to stay connected with the upcoming events or just want to tell your pre-med friends about the pre-med CC, you can find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok as at pre-med CC. Hello everyone and welcome to today's event. Today we are honored to host Dr. Rohan Radhakrishna. Dr. Rodha Krishna serves as the Deputy Director, Chief Equity Officer, and Tribal Liaison for the California Department of Public Health, and was appointed by Governor Gavin Newsom in 2021 and confirmed by the Senate to lead the, health, the Office of Health Equity. Dr. Rodha Krishna strives to uphold the universal values of love, dignity, and transformation. He believes in inequity in a world of abundance is morally and socially unacceptable. Dr. Ratha Krishna aims to advance partnerships to change narratives and power structures to help create a California for all. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Ratha Krishna. It's my pleasure. Namaste, the spirit in me honors the spirit in all of you. Thank you so much, Jubin and Madeline, for all your organization and this invitation and to all the pre-med CC team that's organized these sessions and those of you who are watching. I am Rohan, and I stand for love, dignity, and transformation. And it wasn't long ago when I was in your shoes at your stage in life, figuring out the impact I wanted to make on the world and how to get the skills and the support in order to do so. In this session, I'm going to share a little bit about a day in the life of being a public health doctor and deputy health director and officer and also a chief equity officer, another title to my role that I didn't know back when I was in my early school days, but it was something core to my values of really improving the health of all people by getting to root causes and creating that structural change. So you all are the future. I'm convinced that adults got us into this mess and we can't trust uh, adults and those that have been part of systems of the past to create a just, multiracial, inclusive democracy and climate resilient future. It's really up to you. We have tremendous inequities in our workforce. We don't look like and sound like the Californians that we are here to serve and you all are part of that solution. So I'm honored to share a little bit of my story and journey, a little bit of about what keeps me passionate and what I do on a daily basis and the very privileged role that I have and happy to answer some questions for you all along your journey. I remember how hard it was to find mentors, people that thought like me, come from similar backgrounds, had a vision of maybe coming from unique backgrounds and wanting a different path forward on a health journey. I flunked the MCAT several times myself. I had many setbacks. I took lots of what I called time on when I got off the conveyor belt and escalator of traditional academic training to find myself, to figure out what mattered to me, to search for solutions and mentorship, and to get non-traditional skills in non-traditional places outside of academia to hone 
um, my, my mission and my skills to, to be on this journey. So happy to share more of that with all of you. Uh, I'm gonna share screen now and share some slides, some photos, some concepts, some frameworks, some definitions that are part of my journey and root me in the work that I do in hopes that some of it resonates with all of you. If it doesn't, we're here to discuss and debate. Uh, there's no single truth, we're creating it together. Um, but I hope to do that for about 45 minutes and, and then take about 45 minutes to really be open to learning from all of you, answering your questions, be as supportive as I can in any way. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and share screen. All right. So, as you see here, the title of today's session is A Day in the Life of a Public Health Doctor and Chief Equity Officer. My name is Rohan and I use he, him pronouns. And if you want to look me up on Twitter, my handle is at Dr. Rohan Rad. Here we are in the beginning of February of 2023. And I start with that image on the top, which is the heart guiding the head. I think it's so important that we stay true to our core values, our culture, our upbringing, our family, the things that got us as far as we did, those who came before us, and not let the head that can be filled with achievement, with performance, with comparison, with anxiety, dominate um, in all the decisions that you make moving forward. I hope you stay true to who you truly are and that you let the heart lead the head as you make these important decisions for your career moving forward. I'll tell you about my journey and what got me to where I am today. And I'll end with a few opportunities for different students to really join the public health workforce. There's internship opportunities, whether it's the fall or the spring, where we will pay you to be embedded in a local health department. That type of grounded real world experience is an opportunity to try on what it's like to be part of public service, what it's like to be part of the field of public health, no matter what profession you choose, if it's social work or nursing or medicine or pharmacy, um, there's a lot of opportunities within public health. It's something that I wasn't even exposed to. There wasn't a public health major in my undergraduate career. I'm glad it's across different community colleges and state universities and private universities now. That wasn't the case 20 years ago when I was studying, so I'm happy to offer these opportunities to you. We want you to join us. You are part of our future. You're a part of building trust with community, we learned that as the number one lesson from COVID. And I was, you know, one of those officers in the command center at the local level and at the state level during the pandemic the past couple years. So having staff that the community trusts is so important. And so I'll end with some opportunities for you to join us. Um, and we'll even pay you to be part of our public health workforce moving forward. So I want to start with the land and labor acknowledgement which is that we have to acknowledge that we're all living off the taken ancestral lands of indigenous peoples from time immemorial. And I want to acknowledge the extraction of brilliance, energy, and life for labor that was forced upon people of African descent for more than 400 years. Here we are celebrating Black History Month and we need to honor and celebrate the res resilience and strength of all indigenous people, as well as descendants from Africa who have been shown in this country and worldwide. And we carry all of our ancestors in us and we're continually called to be better as we lead this work forward. I encourage you to look into what land you may be upon, to consider reaching out to the local tribal chair people to learn about ways you can support them and to just remember um, with humility all that came before us, all that was taken and our role in aiming to redress those harms from the past, which are key to health equity. I wanna share this photo of, of my ancestors. This is on my mother's side, my paternal, um, my maternal grandfather and grandmother. They are from South Asia, from South India in the province of Karnataka. Um, that's more than 60 million people, more than one and a half times the size of, of California, hard to imagine. Uh, and just, I, I ground myself in this history of my ancestors because they came from a mixed caste background. They overcame barriers of difference through their connection, through their love, through forming a family. And my grandmother featured on the left was a teacher 
Um, doctor comes from the Latin word doctore, which is actually to teach. And um, I'm so grateful and stand on the shoulders of many amazing women in my family background. Her parents died when she was young and she was orphaned and actually had to care for her younger sisters. And as a teacher, she earned enough money to send her younger sister to medical school in India, one of the first doctors in that province in the town of Mysore. Um, she ended up uh, forming an orphanage and a hospital and taking in abandoned children. Back in those days, there was a lot of female infanticide with young females being left um, uh, and she um, really supported her sister to be a leader in the community, one of the first doctors in that part of India, and really uh, a change agent for social change. So I stand on the shoulders of many amazing women um, before me that uh, ultimately um, migrated to the United States um, and, and served in rural parts of America where I was born and raised in Illinois in farmland and then in Kansas for my public um, secondary school before I came to California for college in search of more diversity, both with people and nature. So I wanna honor my ancestors as I have this talk with you. Also wanna give thanks to my partner, Fumi, who's listed here. Uh, she came to this country as an immigrant. Uh, English was her third language, came to Southern California as a young teenager. This is during our wedding um, when we fused aspects of our Japanese and Indian background, getting married in the Redwoods and Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, and just reminds me um, that many of us come from immigrant backgrounds and diverse backgrounds, that California has that as a tremendous strength in its diversity. Um, and even my, my wife's struggle to speak English to fit in is something that many of the, the patients that we hope to serve and support experience. Uh, and is just a reminder that we wanna bring our diverse backgrounds to the work that we do. These are my children on the left and my niece and nephew on the right. Um, Rio and Rumi keep me grounded, keep me joyful when the, the work in tackling racism and climate change and classism and housing and homelessness and structural barriers can get heavy around the dinner table. They keep things light um, with, with dad jokes. I'll, I'll leave you with one dad joke to start off today, um, which is, um, uh, you know, my daughter says I only get one dad joke for every talk that I give. So I'll, I'll try and keep this, this, this quick and light. Um, and so what do you call someone who makes dad jokes, but isn't actually a dad? A faux pas, bit of a French play on words there for your bad dad joke of the day. Um, but really reminds me of the joyfulness of youth and that we really need to listen to our youth to get us solutions for the future. I want to share this from the American Medical Association that I was not a member of for many years because they didn't speak for me. Um, many of um, the priorities were focused around payment, and there's been a major transformation. I'm grateful to new women of color that have taken on leadership roles within the AMA, including Dr. Aletha Maybank, who supported their organizational strategic plan to embed racial justice and advance health equity. And um, wow, back when I was uh, in, in college, this was not front and center for a national trade organization of health professionals, but now it is times have changed and it's really up to you to take us next level to make this a reality. But I wanna read from this, that we really envision a nation in which all people live in thriving communities where resources work well, where systems are equitable and create no harm, back to that Hippocratic oath, nor exacerbate existing harms, where everyone has the power, conditions, resources, and opportunities to achieve optimal health, and all health professionals are equipped with the consciousness, the tools, and the resources to confront inequities, dismantle white supremacy, racism, and other forms of exclusion and structured oppression, as well as embed racial justice and advance equity within and across all aspects of health systems. Wow, how powerful of a charge. I hope every institution that you're a part of, be it a community college, be it a graduate school, be it a medical school, adopts such forward thinking policies and statements and ultimately operationalizes them. Um, I'll, share, I'll sit, share many things today. They're my personal views, don't ref necessarily reflect the administration that I serve today, but want you to know about some powerful organizational values and statements from um, organizations like the AMA that are part of our workforce.
I also want to ground us in humility and honor the work of Melanie Trevelon and Jan Marais Garcia about cultural humility, which is really a commitment to personal and institutional transformation by realizing and redressing power, privilege, and prejudice. So this is part of a lifelong learning commitment and a critical self-reflection journey. I am still a student and have to realize my own power, privilege, and prejudice. Uh, first of all, I am cisgender. I am a male. My parents were college educated. I have tremendous privilege. I have a home, a roof over my head, uh, and need to constantly learn and unlearn many of the biases that I carry. I've benefited from patriarchy, benefited from the myth of the model minority of South Asians and Indians, and um, uh, benefited from some in my family background that were of higher socioeconomic class origin and just need to ground myself in that reality. Um, many of us have aspects of subjugation and aspects of privilege, and it's important to acknowledge those complex inter intersectional aspects of our identity. Some things that may have led us to have less opportunity um, can be part of our connection point and part of that crack that brings the light as we do this work. But we also have to acknowledge our privilege with humility um, when, when working with, with um, under-resourced and historically disinvested populations. Um, ultimately, that's part of promoting institutional accountability and changing the systems and structures that we may have the benefit of being a part of. And so part of that humility is the noble choice to forego our status to make influence for broader good. Um, as part of my journey from being a student to a doctor to a public health officer, I worked for 10 years in the county of Contra Costa in the East Bay in the San Francisco Bay region in Contra Costa County. And before I left, we were one of many jurisdictions that adopted a resolution that formally declared racism as a public health crisis. The Center for Disease Control, the following year with Dr. Walensky made a declaration that racism is a serious public health threat. Getting back to those root causes of decades, centuries ago that put us in the place we are that allow some people to live 10 to 20 years less than others in certain places and zip codes um, based on certain backgrounds. And so I'm proud to be a part of a broader team in a health agency that really named it, but we need to go beyond words. It's about the actions to create the outcomes for an equitable future. And I think all diverse health professionals and particularly our younger generation really need to push and challenge us to make true on these declarations so they become realities for diverse communities. When I was appointed by Governor Nursum to serve as a deputy director for our state office of health equity and serve the California Department of Public Health, it was such an honor. This is me during the press conference, the very first shelter in place um, uh, edict that came down in the United States happened in California in the Bay Area um, back when the cruise ships um, brought COVID-19 to the shores of California and the United States. And so I was part of that team on the very first um, moment back in March of 2020. Here we are almost three years later. Um, so that's that photo. And it was uh, interesting when I was appointed to the state role, you could see some of the social media comments after the press release. When will a doctor with a name like Sam Jones be appointed to head such an agency? Why is it always someone with an unpronounceable name and a foreigner? Well, I'm not a foreigner. I was born in a farm town in Illinois. I grew up in Kansas. I'm, I'm American as everyone else. Um, and it just really um, was a wake up call about how polarized of a society that the color of my skin, that the letters of my name would be a threat to some people and may have them view me as being unqualified for a role. And we know that that polarization and mis and disinformation and that the chasm of the isms in our society really led to a lot of the inequities that we have and made them worse during the pandemic time. And so it's important for us to build bridges with people of all backgrounds, of all political persuasions to really form bridges towards the future. And, and that can be challenging when we have been personally attacked 
um, health officers have been given death threats and have been targeted personally. Their phone numbers and addresses shared at Board of Supervisors meetings um, when people may not have liked some of the health promoting um, policies that we've supported to try and save lives. And so it's just really important that we, we walk a fine line in being humble and true to who we are, um, but try and form those bridges moving forward in this time of extreme polarization. I wanna take you back to my college thesis. Um, when I was in college and I wasn't sure what I wanted to study, I knew I was interested in people and also policies and science and health. Um, I ultimately studied human biology and Latin American studies, knowing how important the Latino population was in California. And to understand more of the historic origins, I spent some time studying abroad in Chile and learning about indigenous health from the Mapuche. And um, so important to understand the role of culture in health. And this was my college thesis, learning about the integration of traditional health practices with modern medicine. I'm grateful for all that I learned from community leaders and traditional elders in doing this work. But one advice to you uh, folks that may still be in their undergraduate studies is to not be afraid to take time on to take time to do an internship, to do research, to study abroad, to get off that escalator of units and classes and majors and having to meet a certain timeline in order to pursue your passions. Um, I took some extra time and um, used as many of those breaks and tried to get research grants to fund my time to learn from community, to live with community. And that was really important. Uh, another piece of advice is to maybe focus on skills more than content. Instead of taking a class, say, on COVID or on the HIV epidemic that's more content-based, uh, I chose to take classes that were more skill-based, whether it's public speaking or community-based participatory research, a concrete skill that I could use for diverse problems and challenges and topics, no matter what my future may hold. Then in graduate school, um, I studied at Stanford for my undergraduate, um, took several years on and went to South America, learned from different communities, did research, spent some time figuring out. I kind of had to get away from, from academia and school to figure out what I really wanted to do when I, when I grow up, and then ended up at Berkeley um, in a joint program where I studied public health and medicine. And so for my public health training, I was very interested in displacement and populations that were impacted, be it by war or migration or climate change or development induced displacement. And I worked through the Human Rights Center, um, was very interested in, in human rights concepts, of course, healthcare being one that we're still fighting for, um, basic needs, um, housing, social needs, food, uh, income, a meaningful job and wages, a living wage. Um, but I ended up studying um, for a couple summers in northern Uganda, where there was more than a 20 year civil war and youth were impacted and displaced. There was this population of itinerant children who didn't feel safe at night because they could get abducted and become um, soldiers in, in the Lord's Resistance Army. And they had unique health challenges. So I wanted to, to learn from them what were some of their health challenges and their strengths as well, and use the combination of qualitative and quantitative research methods to try and support humanitarian organizations like UNICEF and the Norwegian Refugee Council. Again, using some of those research class tools that I learned to try and help a population that was going through a tough time. Of course, I, I learned more than, than I gave through my work, but it was able to help the humanitarian organizations to convince the government to keep some resources in place for these kids and prioritize schools and housing and health, ultimately, in some of the assessments that I wrote um, working as a consultant. Um, I did this simultaneously while in medical school and took some extra time. I wanted to study public health and medicine at the same time to have them influence each other since I knew how important the upstream was. And even in medical school, I took time on. I took an extra year and I went to India. I wanted to learn more about different health um, perspectives and systems and uh, studying chronic disease was um, important in a, in a cultural context outside of an academic context. Um, so encourage you again, if it's research or internships or time in a particular community to, to stay pluripotent and undifferentiated. There's always a pressure to pick something and go in and ultimately it's good to have some, some expertise, um, but generalism can be helpful as well and cross-cutting tools can be applied in a lot of contexts. Um, I then went on to ultimately study family medicine for my residency 
residency training. And that was largely influenced by a lot of these place-based, community-based experiences because I wanted to help the whole community. And I felt having diverse skills as a family doctor would help me do that um, and choosing that as a specialization. Um, I, I say it is a specialization being a generalist because there's concepts like life course theory, like family theory, um, that influence us. And we know from adverse childhood experiences and trying to promote positive childhood experiences, the importance of the ecosystem, the community and the family for setting an individual in a positive health trajectory. And so that's part of the reason that I chose that. This is a photo from uh, Hurricane Katrina. And as a medical student during my spring break, I, I went to the, the Ninth Ward in New Orleans to support some um, NGOs on the ground, um, pretty similar to an itinerant displaced population in Uganda from a war. So we're going to see climate change as the major health threat for this century that's going to be displacing populations, showing up at our border, people moving even within our country due to displacement from a variety of factors, be it economic, gentrification or climate induced migration. And there are cross cutting lessons that I learned, whether it was in New Orleans or in northern Uganda, about listening to people on the ground, those closest to the problems, having the solutions um, and really embedding them from day one from a human centered design perspective in the solutions for the future. Um, this is doing community-based participatory research. So whether you're doing an academic project and working on um, any health condition, uh, going to the people, um, putting the pens and the tools and the resources, paying them for their time and expertise, having them ask the questions, the people in their own language. Those are the types of things that I learned during graduate school that I still use in my work today. Here I am with youth who created a song and dance for the government leaders to tell them about the importance of preserving Serving their shelters and their schools and their, their health clinics. Um, and so we, we often hear about this balance between nature and nurture. And here you see place on the map as well as the DNA of the matrix. And you hear that oftentimes it is the zip code that's more powerful than the genetic code in influencing a person's health. And this image is the Bay Area Rapid Transit BART train station map from the East Bay. Um, I live in Oakland. That's where I'm coming to you from today. And I worked in Contra Costa County where Pittsburgh and Walnut Creek is. And for almost a decade, I worked in a clinic in the Richmond San Pablo area at a federally qualified health center. And you can see this is old data, but more than a 10 year difference in just a 20 minute train ride on the BART. Um, and this is influenced, not just affecting life expectancy at birth, but there's differences in median household income, educational attainment, and even health outcomes like childhood asthma hospitalization. Place really matters when you look at where freeways were built, where historic redlining took place, that affected who could get loans, that affected intergenerational wealth building and resiliency. Um, and so this is why I'm so honored to be speaking with many of you of diverse backgrounds, some of you first to go to community college in your family, to know that this doesn't have to be your destiny. Um, we will overcome the isms of the past and the historic disinvestment to level the playing field of these outcomes for the future. You know, we've shifted from playing defense with disparities to moving towards offense with equity. This is a roadmap to reducing disparities from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that's over 10 years um, old. And it talks about quality was the big concept back then. And we, we've come a longer ways. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement now put out a white paper that talks about substance over show, we want results, we want everyone involved. So leadership really matters and you will be the leaders of the future. So the words you use, the authenticity, the tone from the top really matters. Um, but where we use our scarce resources has to prioritize those who are furthest behind. That is the last will be first those who are historically disinvested. And we did that here in California when we had scarce resources during the pandemic, where we put those vaccines at first was in those least healthy neighborhoods because we knew those communities would have the least access, less likely to have broadband access or cars or knowledge or speak English to get uh, in front first in line. And so those concepts we continue to use today. Seeing with new eyes and learning to see barriers as well as assets is important. And knowing that it's a personal journey does as a group. Um, noting that um, if you wanna go far, 
um, go together. If you want to go fast, maybe you go alone, but that we need to move as a group. And I know that your group, Pre-Med CC, is really much about group empowerment and change. So I really like this model of health. It's part of that multi-layered structural and contextual factors that influence the life course. And you can see culture is the major driver of our values, our beliefs. We can have a vaccine, we can have a mask, we can have a therapeutic and a tool, a blood pressure medicine, a diabetes medicine, uh, information on nutrition and exercise, but whether or not people adopt it is often influenced by culture. And we have to be those cultural brokers of the future through trust. And so on the bottom, you can see the intergenerational effects of even before conception, the importance of the conditions, the environment, the neighborhood and culture, ultimately affecting those health outcomes throughout the life course. So while we may focus on the right side with those biological pathways, really those outer concentric circles are the major drivers of health, family cohesion, social connectedness, caregivers, healthy living conditions, clean air, access to nutrition and foods, and the structural drivers. On the right, you see a roadmap to resilience from our uh, first Surgeon General, Dr. Nadine Burkharis. That's a really good resource for how we come out of this pandemic through resiliency. And I'd like to define the term. Equity is in my title as the Chief Equity Officer. There's a variety of ways to um, describe this, and this is one of many infographics. You can see it's not about equality or sameness. We will not achieve equity by giving the same intervention to everyone because we all come from different backgrounds and um, different levels of opportunity. So equity is really efforts that ensure that all people have full and equal access to opportunities that enable them to lead healthy lives. And so you can see on the right, um, those pillars are different based on what people need. This is another graphic and the sources at the bottom, um, which I really like because it goes beyond just the notion of equity to really aim towards justice, um, which will require broader transformation. Um, it's not just, okay, there's some unequal access with inequality. So if we put more resources over here, be it um, doctors um, from diverse backgrounds or be it access to medicines or vaccines or uh, a nursing workforce or overcoming a food desert that will solve the problem. Um, we really have to level the playing field by making sure those distributed tools and assistance allow people to reach for those opportunities, be it educational attainment or mentorship or um, economic means to move forward or access to health and medications and, and other resources. We wanna go beyond that um, to really promote equity, which is customizing the tools to address the root causes of it. And so you can see there that the ladder on the right under the equity bucket is higher than the one on the left. So a person can um, feed themselves um, and not be dependent on someone when giving them a fish, but they can learn how to fish and get for what they need themselves. And we really wanna go beyond that by creating structural change. We wanna change the tree. We wanna change the structures, the policies, the laws that got us to this equitable, inequitable present. And there you see the structural shifting of the tree to level the playing field. Um, so this is a nice infographic and in how I uh, go about describing some of these terms and concepts. Here you see another infographic, um, which is adopted from the Bay Area Regional Health Inequities Initiative, Bar High, um, adopted by the California Endowment. And so you may think of health or medicine on the right as decreasing death and disability and disease, um, trying to change those behaviors through education, around nutrition and activity and stress. But really, it's those upstream drivers that um, led me to largely hang up my white coat as a family doctor after 10 years. Um, I do you know, a couple clinics a month now to keep up my skills and stay grounded, but really focus on the left on upstream prevention, on changing the narrative, on changing the distribution of power and decision-making and resources. And you can see what's really driving that is moving beyond that exclusionary narrative we have to a narrative of belonging of people of all backgrounds and really empowering youth of, like you all of diverse backgrounds um, to really design that future that we want to see through a stronger social compact, through moving from social vulnerability to social resiliency. So I had the honor to serve here in the Bay Area for 10 years in Contra Costa Health Services, first as a resident as part of their family medicine residency training program. And I intentionally chose to not go to an ivory tower um, academic 
uh, institution for my residency training. Of course, it was affiliated with UC Davis and then UC San Francisco and was a high quality training, but I wanted to be grounded at a community general hospital at federally qualified health centers with that um, diverse, um, less served Medi-Cal population to really serve the underserved um, the least served, the inappropriately served, and be rooted um, in, in that community as part of my training. Also be rooted in a, in a broader family medicine training where I had to really get diverse skill sets, which served me well, um, whether that was doing the cesarean section or doing the intubation um, or getting the skills. So when I went to less resourced areas, be it in rural areas or global areas, I felt that I had the skills and training to really support in, in, in less resourced areas. You can see that that was part of the regional medical center, health centers in detention, just one small part of a broader health services agency that tackles many things from insurance through the health plan to behavioral health, to housing, to hazardous materials, environmental health, emergency medical services, and ultimately public health. And towards the end of my 10 years there, I moved into the role of being a deputy health officer to really support all aspects of health while my portfolio focused more on the social, behavioral, and environmental aspects of supporting um, a, a very large health department in a, in a very large county of more than a million people. Um, and that was important to me was to serve uh, in, in a broad, diverse county context and a reason why I chose to go to a residency training program in an environment like that. Now, of course, many threats and challenges came during my time there, whether it was power safety shutoffs or air quality issues from wildfire or extreme heat events or a once in a century pandemic. And so all the skills that I learned during my training from um, speaking other languages, to listening to community, to qualitative and quantitative rapid research, uh, to public engagement were skills that I could use during when the pandemic hit and we needed um, culturally grounded leadership during a public health crisis. So I'm grateful for all those skills and opportunity that I learned from community along the way. As a doc in a federally qualified health center, here I am in Richmond, San Pablo, California, um, at the, the clinic that I still work at a couple times a month. And we really brought patients to the table to co-design with us um, with the permission of our, of our patients here, Cedric and Patricia. They were our experts and they told us having blood pressure, what was needed for the inequities in the African-American community. We met with them. They helped us with co-design exercises. We bought the administrators in the room to really design um, a multi-pronged uh, project to try and uh, improve what's still the number one killer, even with COVID, cardiovascular disease and cancer are still the top killers that lead to um, premature death, which to me is the biggest inequity to have certain populations based on race or based on place living 10 to 15 years less means we have a lot of work to do for, for building trust and overcoming barriers of the past. And so we ultimately created a group model um, and we wanted it to really be by people of color for people of color. And so we had community health workers, we had a black psychologist, many of the, the, the patients that joined this group were formerly involved in the justice system, and they really helped bring people in. It was, th that's really the highest mortality group is coming home from being um, in, the, in the justice system. Uh, you have a very high mortality in those first two weeks and in the first year. And so bringing people in, welcoming them, um, saying, we have been waiting for you. We have resources for you. We want to hook you up with all the services that you need and deserve to stay healthy. Welcome home. And to do so with people with that lived experience as part of the workforce was so important to address the traumas of racism and stress with the black psychologists to teach mindfulness and skills to get them through the challenging president transition was so important. And the data showed that we also lowered blood pressure. So they named the group how low can you go? We were focused on blood pressure and hypertension since the data showed the greatest inequities in our African-American population. And you can see here 
After six months, we lowered systolic blood pressure from 153 in this group down to 134, um, which can lead to, when you sustain it, up to a 25% reduction in heart attacks and strokes. So really making a big difference in a high impact population through a culturally informed group model. I was the doc in the back because we didn't have enough black doctors. That's why we need a more diverse workforce. You know, We have 6% um, black Californians, but only 3% Black health professionals. We have 40% Latinos in California, um, but almost eight to 10 less inequities of health professionals who are Latino. Um, so we have tremendous inequities, which is why I, I'm so grateful for the work you all are doing to create diverse career pathways for our future health professionals. It's needed. Here is one of our uh, images on a poster to increase um, equity amongst the flu vaccination. This was pre-pandemic. And we noted that um, amongst our black patients, there was lower uptake in flu. And what we learned from the H1N1 um, uh, epidemic that we saw almost a decade ago was that it was actually um, black moms that were the trusted people in their community. When they said, you ain't coming to my house for Thanksgiving unless you've gotten your flu shot, that was powerful. And so we wanted to get narratives and not hear why people didn't get their flu shot, but why people did. And we know that people of color and men in particular have not been treated well in the media. Um, there's so much implicit and explicit bias, stereotype threat, microaggressions. And so we reached out to 10 of our black patients and said, why did you get the flu shot? We wanna follow that narrative. And here you see a young man saying that he got it for his little daughter. I got my flu shot for her. Speak to a hospital staff member to get your flu shot today. So those types of positive narrative changes were, were so important and we wanted to put them front and center and we plastered them all over our walls and our virtual screensavers as well. Now, when I said to our communications team, well, you know, I'd love to support this as well. Could you put a photo of me and my daughter? They said, first of all, Dr. Rohan, you're not black. And second of all, no, no topless shots allowed. Um, but just a brief joke to, to, to say how important it is to center the stories and quotes from real people as we try to create positive narratives moving forward. Here I am having a little bit of um, skin to skin time with my, my daughter, Rumi, who's now nine years old and is the boss of the house and tells me what to do. Um, but bringing people from the community to places of power was so important because um, they tell it like it is. So this is again from, from Cedric, um, who was part of our hypertension team. He went to Sacramento to tell the director of um, payment reform and healthcare services at the time that, you know, we don't really care how much you know until we know how much you care and that um, you need to listen and give your ears the same opportunity as your mouth. And that, that, that humility of really listening to people on the ground for what's needed. If they say, we need a more diverse health workforce, we need people we can trust who speak our languages, who look like us, th then we need to drive the incentives and the programs of the future in that direction, which is what you all are doing. Um, when I became a deputy health officer and the pandemic hit, this was one of our outreach activities when we first got vaccines on the scene and we were trying to build trust in the Latino community. So in San Pablo, where I worked, just two blocks from the clinic was a church of San Pablo. And here I am um, with uh, Padre Lazaro uh, Sandoval, and we are doing a joint event. It's outdoors, it's on the baseball field. So literally going to their home base. Here we are at home base, giving a sermon together that we co-designed about trust, trusting public health, trusting science. There's a lot of misinformation in the Latino community spreading on WhatsApp and other social media channels um, about what's in the vaccine or what to do or not do, um, getting a test, how it could harm you, the swab up your nose, may it damage your brain, a, a lot of false information. And so hearing both from the, the community leader, the padre from the church, as well as me, a doctor in the community, I brought along a first year resident, um, uh, Dr. Sofia Gonzalez, um, you know, who who, who comes from, from the Latina community, uh, part of our future diverse workforce. And I brought my daughter as well, who, who talked about the importance of kids being involved and some, some basic messages of washing your hands. You know, doctors don't wash their hands for 20 seconds with soap and water if you put a secret video camera. And yet we're trying to get our kids to do it in schools to decrease transmission in schools and daycares. And so just like they may remind us to put our seat belts on, they can remind us basic hygiene, washing hands. So really taking an intergenerational 
intersectional, intersectoral approach towards trust building. That's the type of, of community grounded equity work that we wanted to model going forward. Um, another moment as a deputy health officer was during the heat wave that we had. Um, if you remember back in September of 2020, we had the pandemic. We had wildfires in the Bay Area. The sky looked like doomsday. There was smoke in the air. We didn't know whether to keep the windows open or closed because it was hot and there was COVID and there was smoke. And NPR did an interview with me when they asked me, well, you know, we hear there's a, there's a lot of Asian people in San Francisco that are drinking hot tea and eating spicy food during a heat wave. What would you recommend? And I really had to flip it and say, that isn't the question we should be asking right now. We're at the center of an unfortunate Venn diagram with multiple overlapping emergencies. We're trying to address racism and social inequity and climate change and poor air and a novel virus. So let's talk about what got us into certain communities being at higher risk for these overlapping threats and what's going to get us out of it. And the reporter ended up shifting and doing a story on asthma in certain neighborhoods and how that burden of poor air quality from pollution and wildfires on top of being near highways where there's a higher chronic burden of exposure to chronic disease and the link perhaps from a respiratory pathogen like COVID with underlying asthma as a respiratory risk factor can create more impact for communities of color um, was, was the direction that the story took. Um, so, you know, People may come to us with, with certain biases and perspectives about certain cultures or things that they think are important. And it's up to us as health leaders to connect the dots for the issues that really matter. And speaking of what matters, you know, we'll often start a, a clinical encounter with what's the chief complaint? What are your, what's your problem? And really we're trying to flip that narrative and not ask people what's the matter with you, but what matters most to you? And when we did that, we found something very interesting. We partnered with an organization called Health Leads that had uh, students like you all as interns embedded in clinics as advocates that helped patients get the needs met and what mattered most to them. And when we asked um, a couple hundred patients in three different languages, I think it was English, Spanish, and Vietnamese in our clinic in Richmond, San Pablo, they said food, they said housing, they said jobs, they said insurance, and they said getting connected to public benefits like um, paying for my electricity. They didn't say diabetes or asthma or blood pressure. And so that's what we did. We started screening for social needs. We almost added that to the vital signs when people came in as part of the intake. Do you need help with any of these social needs? What matters to you? And then we connected them to people to deliver on those things that they needed. So if you just take food security, as one thing, you know, still such a challenge that um, so many children and families in California are nutrition insecure. Um, and, and how can we really deal with chronic disease if we aren't starting with the basics of nutritious food access that we would ask this question. And if somebody screened positive for being food insecure, we would enroll, enroll them with supplemental nutrition like CalFresh. We would connect them to a food bank and we would even bring food on site into our clinic. And so here we are with the mobile farmer's market on site in our clinic. And we connected thousands of patients to these resource connections, more than 50% screened positive for a social need. But you know, it's really challenging. The barriers are so tough because behind this mobile farmer's market truck at my clinic is the dollar store. And that's what we're up against. My patients with chronic disease are shopping at the dollar store and buying carbs and high fructose corn syrup drinks because that's what they may be able to afford. So when I had a patient, Nancy, whose diabetes was still under control um, and not getting better, and I was prescribing her insulin and connecting to her to things, she ultimately ended up sharing with me, you know, Dr. Rohan, uh, I'm living in my car. I don't have a refrigerator. I don't have a way to refrigerate my insulin. And while you hooked me up with that farmer's market and they match two to one, if I pay $10, they'll give me $20 and free fresh fruits and vegetables. The truth is I get most of my food from the dollar store. Those realities were so humbling and important for me to hear as a doctor, knowing that we have a lot of upstream change that we need to create. This is a book that is very depressing, The Hacking of the American Mind, that talks about how corporate America is really hijacking bodies and brains and encouraging um, a dependence on, on un unhealthy products, be it sweetened and sugared beverages or be it poor nutritious foods. Um, people turn to that for their dopamine and serotonin and how we really have to tackle those upstream drivers of health. 
And so this, this brings me to a powerful quote from Sir Michael Marmot, which is, what's the point of treating people only to send them back to the conditions that make them ill? It's humbling, you know, I'm grateful to our emergency providers, but if it's just a revolving door and we send them out of the emergency room back to conditions that continue to make them ill, at some point we have to change the conditions. And so it's been a long journey uh, to get to the point I'm at right now, a lot of training, uh, a lot, lot of learning, um, but I'm now in a position where I'm focusing more on the conditions um, and think we need a combination of public health professionals, whether it's nurses or pharmacists or doctors that are also tackling the conditions. And when people say that's out of your lane, stay in your silo, I'll remind them back to the California Code of Regulations that the health department should offer services directed to the social factors that is part of our job and our mandate. So we see here that the U.S. healthcare continues to spend on the wrong things in the wrong time in the wrong places, and that's shifting. If you looked at Cal AIM and California and how we're shifting to more midstream and upstream interventions, how we're starting to support doulas and community health workers and pay for things like housing and, and medically appropriate meals, that we're heading in the right direction finally to address those upstream drivers, and, and you can be a part of that change. I also want to, to root us in our, our universal values. So I have the privilege of having got a training from Dr. Monica Sharma, who taught around the globe with the United Nations. And I strongly believe and encourage you to read the book called Radical Transformational Leadership. And that is being, designing, and leading change from the universal values of dignity, equity, compassion, and humility to transform self, people, systems, and cultures towards equity and sustainable results. Uh, you know, it's about personal change and starting with us and then workforce change, which is what you all are doing. Institutional change. As you go through institutions, don't accept them the way they are. We have to change those pernicious P's, the policies and procedures and protocols. They serve the past. They got us where we are to our inequitable present and they will not serve the future. So you need to be those change agents of the institutions that you belong to now and in the future to ultimately create that PSE, those policy systems and environmental change. This is a spectrum that I like and I encourage you to grade your own institution. If it's your department or your major or your medical program or your, your community college, at the next meeting that you go to, talk to your dean. Talk to your committees and have them rate themselves. Where are you on your continuum to becoming an anti-racist, multicultural institution? Are you passive? Are you making symbolic change? Are you doing identity change that may be a little token? Or are you really creating structural transformational change and being fully inclusive? What's needed to go from a three to a four or a four to a five? And how can you be a part of that change in your institutions? So I'm honored to now work for the Office of Health Equity with the California Department of Public Health. The office has been around for 10 years, and the vision is that everyone in California has equal opportunities for optimal health, mental health, and well-being. Part of the governor's California for All agenda is really allowing our office to support the department, the agency, and all of the agencies to create a California for All. That's part of why I decided to leave medicine straight up and serving at the county level to serve at the state level, because I really believe in the governor's slogan of a California for all, which really to me is an equity agenda. Our department is housed within the largest agency in the largest state, California, and is called HHS, the Health and Human Services Agency. We have 17 different departments and offices. Public health is just one of them. And I'm so proud that with the leadership of Secretary Mark Galli and our Undersecretary Marco Meech and all of the amazing directors, many of whom come from humble backgrounds, they were benefits and recipients of food stamps and women, infant and children, and may have dropped out from community college before they got their training as social workers or doctors and now became state leaders. And I hope you invite some of them to be future speakers in your series. But Part of all of the staff, of our 34,000 staff, was to redefine our North Star and our strategic priorities, and the links are below. So can you believe it? Government, bureaucracy has this now in 2023 as their North Star. That's why I'm so honored to be a public servant, and I identify as a public servant more than I do as a doctor or a healer. 
And some of those North Star statements that I just want to name are equity is not just a word or a concept, but the core value. And we constantly pursue social and racial justice by not lifting all boats only, but especially those boats that need to be lifted more. Another way to phrase that is targeted universalism that John Powell from the Othering and Belonging Institute writes about. And that really gets back to that infographic about equity and not equality. And that's where we need specific interventions for specific communities to move things forward. So at our agency, I'm proud to co-chair our JEDI committee. That stands for Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. So all 17 departments and offices have a chief equity officer, which is a new thing. You know, all institutions before there was the internet and computers and keyboards, you know, I wrote my college essays on a typewriter at first before, before I started printing them out on a computer. We have an equity officer now, just like we had informatics officers or data officers in the past, which is part of a role I'd love to speak about and how we bring equity into our work. Um, here I am with Marcela Ruiz, a lawyer from the Department of Social Services that really champions work for inclusion of our new citizens and our immigrants. And we're focused on language access, expanding our threshold languages, improving our translation and adaptation, whether it's Braille sign language or more languages for our diverse Californians, having an equity dashboard to show our metrics, including training. We have to address our own implicit biases and, and train our workforce um, to be ready for what's needed. Now, within the Department of Public Health, I'm so honored to be serving my boss, Tomas Aragon, who comes from very humble origins, grew up in the mission of San Francisco, um, at some point from a single mom. I hope you invite him to tell his own story about how he dropped out um, from Berkeley and went to San Francisco State for several years before going back and ultimately going to medical school, serving in San Francisco as a health officer, and now as our state's public health officer and director. I'm so honored to, to serve and support his vision, his priorities really being becoming a healing organization through equity and anti-racism, becoming a learning organization by developing our people and constant performance improvement. And you can see as he builds that house of our state's health department through transformation, really being trauma informed is, is key to addressing all the traumas of the past personal as well as systemic to move forward. My office now has these five priorities of advancing racial and social equity in government at the state and local level. Behavioral health equity, something that's been unaddressed for a long time. We have the California Reducing Disparities Project that funds 35 community-based organizations in five priority populations. Tribal, American Indian, Alaskan Native, Asian Pacific Islander, Black African American, Latino, Latinx, and LGBTQ. And so we fund culture-based interventions in community to promote behavioral health resiliency, to do health on people's terms in their own communities. That's one part of our behavioral health equity work. The other is our child and youth behavioral health initiative, where we'll be launching an anti-stigma campaign um, that we just released the $100 million request for proposal. We want it to be by youth for youth, and uh, at the end of my talk, I'll be letting you know about a youth summit that's taking place March 12th in California on the West Lawn of the Capitol building that I encourage you all to join. Our third priority is climate action. And I really am serious that we went through this epidemiological transition where most people died from communicable diseases or infectious diseases, but that changed decades ago to chronic diseases like cardiovascular disease, um, obesity, diabetes, cancer, and others. But we have a third CD, which is climate disease, that will magnify those two, communicable disease and chronic disease. And I'm so grateful that I have a team of climate action-oriented research scientists and epidemiologists that are supporting our state with climate solutions as we move forward. You know, the healthcare sector is part of the problem. We create eight to 10% of greenhouse gases, and we need to be part of the solution by decarbonizing our pathways, our procurements, our hospitals and clinics as well. And really as healthcare leaders, naming that we got to keep fossil fuels in the ground and we need to promote climate resiliency because the same communities that were hit first and worst by COVID 
are those that are hit first and worst by extreme heat, by extreme weather, as we saw with the 10-day heat wave during Labor Day in 2022 and the six atmospheric rivers we just went through um, this winter into 2023. Um, so that's a key part of my Office of Health Equity. We're also aiming for an equitable recovery by supporting health and all policies, working cross sector. And my vision is that every health department in California, we have 61 local health jurisdictions, has an equity officer. Just like they have a tuberculosis controller or a sexually transmitted disease controller, they need an equity officer to connect the dots between community and different sectors. And finally, housing and homelessness. So those are our current five priorities. This is a slide that again really shows how climate change is so cross cutting. I could spend an hour talking about any of the colors or buckets on here um, and really encourage you to, to learn more about the climate crisis and how health professionals are actually the most trusted. And it's the number one reason why Californians are motivated for climate action is because of their own health because they're starting to feel the impact. So it's not just the impact of heat on your kidney filtration or on the safety of your medications and particular interactions. It is and will be a magnifier of communicable and chronic disease and climate disease as well. So as I move to the end of my talk, I want to leave you with this this Venn diagram um, to think about your purpose. Um, this comes from a Japanese concept called Ikigai. And you need to find that sweet spot between something that you love, health, nursing, being a doctor, being an epidemiologist, being a public health educator. You gotta love it. So you're in it for the long haul and you're motivated to get through organic chemistry or residency or whatever those challenges are. You got to be great at it, and you build that over time. You make mistakes a thousand times with humility. That's how we learn. Ideally, it's something that the world needs, and that's why I'm trying to forecast that things like climate and poverty are still at the heart of our health inequities, and so learning about those from the ground up are important as well, and ultimately, you got to get paid for it, right? Um, so you can have a meaningful and fulfilled life and enjoy your other hobbies and passions and dreams, and so I've shifted around on this Venn diagram in terms of what I'm doing at, at a particular point, and I'm still trying to find my sweet spot, but really do have a dream job with the dream team focusing on, focusing on issues that I really care about. So I encourage you to, to visit the schematic as you make decisions moving forward and talk to your mentors. I also want to name that self-care is part of social justice. We continue to have threats in our ecosystem against communities of color, murders uh, against innocent people um, of different backgrounds. We've seen the violence and discrimination against the trans community, against the Asian community, against the black community, and many others. And so it can be a lot to hold. And we know these are your families and communities as well. So I wanna share this toolkit for coping with racial trauma that talks about our various bodies, our mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual bodies, uh, it can seem obvious that we need to unplug, we need to turn our devices off, we need to meditate, we need massages, we need to write and journal, we need to organize and be together. And there's another link that reminds us, when you take a shower tonight, feel the water, feel what's, what's touching your skin and the impact of the environment on ourselves. Be outside. Uh, we need more green time and less screen time. Put your phone away and cry. We, ha we have to acknowledge the, the, the painful challenges that we're seeing and witnessing in our society. I do wanna end by sharing a few opportunities with all of you and we'll put these in the chat. One is the California Pathways into Public Health. The link is on the bottom and the email if you have questions is there as well. And these will be shared with all of you. And so this is an internship program. So no matter where you are in your journey, if you're in community college, if you're already in a health professional school, join us, be a part of our public health workforce. Join us for a couple weeks or months, we will pay you. Our mission is to increase the workforce capacity of those 61 local health jurisdictions across California by providing training, support, and work experience for professionals from historically underrepresented and diverse backgrounds. So we have capacity to hire dozens of you. We need you, we want you. So please um, go to the website to learn more. Um, the only requirement um, is that you need to be part of a community college or university enrolled in at least six core units. Um, so you can reach out to our team members to learn more about that. You know, it was such an honor to be part of building this future of public health. We know that uh, in the United States, 
prevention gets three cents on the dollar. 97 cents goes to those downstream interventions. So we were not prepared like we needed to be for this pandemic. Well, we can't let that be the case for the future and a diverse workforce is a key part of being prepared. So come and join us, try on being a public health public servant for a couple weeks or months. We'd love to have you. This is one example from Kern County in Bakersfield in Southern California. Um, where they worked through Cal State University, through the Bakersfield School of Natural Sciences and Mathematics and their Bachelor's of Science Public Health degree program. Um, and they really wanted to help prepare people for career opportunities. And you can see some of the people, whether they were studying public health that came on board to learn as interns. You can learn more about that particular experience with the links below. And finally, I wanna invite you to the first in the nation Youth Futures Summit. So on March 12th, 2023, with one of our partners called California 100, diverse youth will be coming as part of the time right before your um, UC lobbying day in Sacramento. And I remember being that UC student, getting a bus of student organizers, lobbying in Sacramento for universal health care, um, joining different local um, assembly people and senators to, to lobby for uh, universal health care more than, more than 15 years ago. I was that student. And so we want you to come a day early and join other youth to, to really talk about the future that we want to build. Um, we need your creativity. We need your vision. We need your collective action. It's going to be very diverse from art and DJs um, to a lot of experiences and bonding. And so meet youth um, like you all inspired to create a better future from across California and, and put your collective action together. Um, so with that, I am so honored to be spending some time with you and I'm happy to answer any and all questions so I can support you in your journey moving forward. Thank you. Dr. Roger Krishma, one of the questions is, is these programs like the Cal PPH, is it for people that have finished their undergraduate education or can you be still in school and do them? Um, to my knowledge, you need to be currently enrolled with at least six units in order to apply for that particular pathway program that we have new funding for, and we have funding to pay people for their time. It's designed to be uh, while you're studying, also be learning about public health by being embedded in a local health department. There's other opportunities. That's one particular one I wanted to share with you since we have new funding for it and it's very specific to public health. You know, a lot of people don't have opportunities to know what actually is public health. It's this buzzword, we've learned about it during the pandemic, um, but what is it actually like to be embedded in a department? And so that's one particular opportunity and um, you can share the link Jubin in the chat so people can learn more about the inclusion criteria to see if they qualify. And then when we have one uh, student asking about, so UCLA has a new major in public health for undergraduate students, and they also have a public health minor. Do you think um, it's better to major in public health or minor in it if you're interested in going into public health? Great question. Tomato, tomato, major, minor. I didn't even have a public health major as an option back when I was doing my undergraduate studies. And so here's the thing. <clears throat> it's less about the words and it's more about the skills and the experience. There may actually be a class outside of public health that's gonna teach you the skills that you feel will fill a gap for you. Or there may be an internship opportunity at a local office that may be a little bit different than public health, but related, and so that's okay. Um, it's okay to also take time to figure this out, talk to different people and have different majors and minors. I did both. Um, my, my major was in human biology. My minor was in Latin American studies. Didn't seem like it'd be important for a pre-med to study that, but I knew I needed to learn Spanish. I needed to learn about the culture of diverse communities in California and their origins. And so I studied Latin American studies because I thought it was important to being uh, a public health policy leader in the future. And I'm glad that I took those classes and I didn't minor in chemistry um, or something else. 
And we have one question that says, I'm interested in finding strategies to increase diversity in clinical trials, especially in an oncology. What would be a public health policy or pathway to help achieve that? Great question. And I'm going to point you to the Office of Planning and Research, OPR, if you Google that, and you Google precision medicine. They have a whole initiative dedicated to just that. One of my staff is actually speaking on their advisory board in a couple of weeks, bringing that data epidemiology perspective um, to deal with that very issue. You know, decades ago, we didn't have women in clinical trials. So a lot of our therapeutics were geared more based on the biology and physiology of men. Now we don't have enough people of color. And we knew that was an issue for vaccine confidence. People wanted to know how many black people were in that trial? How many Latino people? How many people of, who identify as tribal were enrolled? We have different backgrounds. Um, we wanna see ourselves represented as well um, as the PIs, but also as the subjects participating in those trials, overcoming the distrust from Tuskegee in the past. So it's a really important question. Um, you can learn more about that particular issue. They're really trying to drive that across California. I know different institutional review boards at different academics within the UCs are also interested in diverse representation in clinical trials. That's one that I'm more familiar at the state that's trying to provide a leadership role. So check that one out. But ultimately, it's about not accepting the status quo. And some of those concepts that I shared, um, like targeted universalism, you may need to oversample a historically underrepresented group in a clinical trial to have more representation, to build more trust for a particular intervention. And it's up to you to be that voice. And maybe we need to pay extra to do more outreach or offer incentives to get those people enrolled in trials. And we have a lot of questions about people wondering from your path from medicine to public health. Um, and I think just to start off with those questions, somebody wants to know when you were, how did you develop your answer to the question, why medical school and how you were able to articulate the need for doctors and public health during that, the, that answer? Yeah. So there is a spectrum. There are plenty of doctors who don't do public health work and the majority of public health professionals who aren't a doctor. In my Office of Health Equity, where I have almost 100 staff, I am the only MD, and I hired as my assistant deputy director a social worker because of her background in diverse communities as a Nicaraguan immigrant, um, having worked in diverse communities in California, I needed her perspective and expertise to support our public health programming that you can see that's diverse. So it's not an either or, of course, medicine is a long arc and journey in terms of the training involved. You can take it at your own pace, um, in your own way. And uh, I value that experience of really being grounded with real people and their struggles and their conditions and learning from them. I viewed being a doctor as more of being an anthropologist in a broken system, in our healthcare system, in our institutions to ultimately learn how to change those systems. So yeah, it was a lot of science and medicine and pharmacology and learning, but as also being a systems learner and learning how these systems were designed and how they need to be changed for the future. Um, public health was essential. And the reason I studied them at the same time, some people take a year off from their health professional training, whether it's nursing, pharmacy, or medicine, and take a year to go get an MPH. Now there's online MPH programs. I chose to do it simultaneously and kind of have it be blended. There's a lot of pros and cons. You have more options than I did decades ago, which is a, which is a great thing. There's a lot more flexibility. Um, you don't necessarily need an MPH. There's certificates. You can learn about it through online free courses that are now available from the American Public Health Association. The American Medical Association has, has free online modules as well. So there's a lot of pathways to get the skills and exposure. Don't think I have to get a minor or I have to take a class or I need X number of units to get exposed to things. And the other thing is talking to people. Talk to people who are on the journey, maybe three years ahead of you and 10 years ahead of you, and talk to a diversity of perspectives, people who chose to do ABC, BCA, a blend of A and B, to get a sense of the pros and cons of their journey and see if that's the right fit for you. Also, it's choose your own adventure. It's not that once you go down one path, it's permanently your path. You have the opportunity to 
um, jump to a slightly different course to shift to get on new skills. That's part of the, the beauty of the times we're in is we can redefine ourselves and bring different skills to the work that we're doing. Um, so it's not linear, which is a good thing. And um, I think the key for me is choosing the skills and the experiences that will build out your portfolio and finding mentors who are maybe just a few years ahead of you to learn from their experiences and the choices that they made. That was really valuable to me. And just to build off of that, we have a question asking, can you please delve into how you transitioned from family medicine to public health and health equity post-residency? Is it still possible to comp combine clinical medicine with the type of intervention and policy programs that you work on? Yes, you'll often hear, no matter what profession, that people sometimes have an 80-20 split. Um, you may even hear people in academia who do 80% research and 20% clinical care, um, or people who may have moved and started a startup and they still wanna keep their clinical skills up. So they're the chief medical officer for a new telehealth tech company, but they still do 20% clinical time or you know, four days a week doing something, one day a week doing something. Now it's blended with half days and virtual care. So I think it's up to you throughout your professional journey to titrate up and down the percent of what you're doing. You need enough, to, of course, to stay competent so you're not creating harm and you're doing good by people, but you also need enough time dedicated to something so you're having an impact. And so I kind of blended over time less clinical work. You know, residency it may seem like 150% clinical time. I still found time to do leadership training and learn about quality improvement and do that project that I shared with you with health leads to get social need screenings in the clinic. Um, do a little bit, little bit of, of research and leadership building. But after residency, well, I started working four days a week so I could spend a day with my young kids. And then I started adding more quality improvement, more public health oriented projects. Then when I took on a role as department chair of family medicine, doing more leadership and management, a little less clinical care, I titrated it down from 80% to 50%. Then when I took on a role as a deputy health officer, doing more public health work, more systems level work, more committees in the community, I traded, titrated down my clinical time to more like 30%. That was about all I could afford to still have a panel of patients as a primary care provider. And then ultimately, as I shifted more full time into policy, I had to do urgent care work um, since it wasn't enough access for my patients to really have a panel of people that I could be, be available for. So I think over time, you can titrate up and down whatever type of clinical work that you do. And I chose kind of a gradual titrating down of my clinical time so I could um, still stay competent, you know, as, as, a, as a generalist specialist, as a, as a family provider, a comprehensivist, as I like to say, it takes a lot of time, you know, in the future, that may be a four-year residency um, across the board, because it's a lot to learn, all organ systems, all people, all ages, um, cradle to grave, as they like to say. And so you, you got to keep up those skills and, and keep lifelong learning on the clinical realm as well, um, but, but have some time for a few or even one project that you can go deep in um, to, to become more of an expert in a particular domain. For me, it was initially a little more community partnerships, and then it spread a little bit more to behavioral health and then more to environmental and climate. And, and that's now my portfolio and my job at the state. So you can titrate up and down over time. And we have one question. Somebody is wondering, do you have any advice about how to help change mind, people's mindsets when you're trying to address inequality in the community? Yeah, really deep and powerful question. You saw my infographic about culture being the origin um, and some of the values that I shared about humility to overcome biases and the polarized environment that we're in. So I struggle with this question every day. What percent of our time do we put to internal work versus external work? When I was department chair, I made it a requirement that you know the 150 providers at our 11 different federally qualified health centers from Richmond to Antioch and Brentwood had to take training in implicit bias. But how much is a one hour training or a five hour training gonna change a 20, 30 or 40 year old's mindset? Um, it's a start. 
it, it needs to happen earlier, perhaps in elementary school or preschool, certainly in all health professional school. And, and things are changing, as you saw, the American Medical Association is now naming racial justice and the change in consciousness. Here in California, we had legislative and the administration champion the Momnibus Act. If you look at perinatal health inequities, um, we're going to be heading into you know women's history and maternal um, um, honoring. Here we are in Black History Month right now, and we still have a tremendous inequity in the United States, where Black birthing people are six times more likely to die than um, others, and Black infant mortality is three times as high. How much of that is biases of providers? It's a piece of it, but mandating implicit bias training is a, is a piece of the solution. And we did that in California. All OBGYNs and people involved in, in perinatal care now have to take that training. Of course, it would have been ideal if it was earlier in their process, um, but yet the anesthesiologist in the operating room doesn't have to take that training. Maybe the surgical obstetric provider does or family medicine provider. And it's the ecosystem that creates those inequities. So we still have a long ways to go around changing consciousness and education and training is a piece of it. Um, but to me, it's more about the structural change that will change the generation of consciousness and people engaged in our health system moving forward in the future. So it's a balance every day. We got to spend a little bit of our time doing the internal work and modeling that naming our own biases, apologizing for the mistakes that we make, but also creating the structural changes to set it up for more sustainable success. Can I just add one thing to that is um, you don't, I think the, the biggest thing is being uncomfortable and putting a place that you're not familiar with. Now, that does not mean that you need to fly halfway across the world. Um, Dr. Radhakrishna put a map of the BART, you could take literally five BART stations from where you are and be in a place that is a food desert that has all the disparities and all the uh, maladies that exist. So you don't need to go halfway across the world. Now we're talking to Barry because we live in the Bay Area, but if you're in Southern California, um, you could basically, if you're a student at UCLA, you literally have to go three exits and you're in the middle of one of the poorest, has the worst uh, outcomes, uh, highest patient and mortality rate. Um, and it's only three exits from, uh, three exits or six exits, uh, anyways, which the right way. So you don't have to go far. And, and always people say, well, I need to go to a far land place, which requires money, expenses, all of these different things, taking time away from everything else that you're doing. Um, you don't have to do that. You could, there is a lot of uh, local clinics if you have certain skills, like if you speak a foreign language or any of those things. Uh, there's a lot of those things in your own community that you can do that does not require you to go to an exotic place halfway across the world. Um, and I think that, you know, walking in somebody else's shoes, um, I know that every county um, does homeless counts twice a year. You could volunteer and go with people in talk to homeless people that doesn't require a huge time commitment besides on the evening, maybe a little bit hot, maybe a little bit cold to go out there with a paper clip and talk to people that are unhoused. And so, um, so yeah, so I, I, I think it's, it's being uncomfortable and being uncomfortable means that maybe instead of uh, going out with your friends on a Friday night is doing a homeless count or those types of things in your own community. That's right, Jubin, you said it really well. Um, and really, I think transformation is about getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. If that's naming a bias that you see amongst your professors or your clinical teachers, uh, if that's in the culture that you're seeing and how people are projecting the values and undermining them, and you don't have to go far. Um, we're surrounded with um, stories and realities of inequity and there's ways to serve and learn and be grounded very close by, so really important point. I know we're getting a little bit close on time, but we have one question. Um, somebody would like to know if you could please describe a little bit about what the day, your, a day in your life as a public health officer looks like um, and just what that looks like for you. Yeah, so gosh, every day is so different. Um, 
I manage people. I um, have to implement policy and spend the taxpayer's dollars in a way that's responsible and creates impact. I have to analyze data and show that we're moving the needle on things towards outcomes. I have to support my staff uh, in a humane way that acknowledges the challenges that they face. I have to interact with community virtually and in person by going to town halls and community meetings. I have to stay grounded like Jubin said and go to the field where the people are and learn by doing site visits, um, by going to schools and um, community centers um, and uh, not just taking something at face value from a report, uh, but really ground truthing it with people's stories. I may testify to the legislator as a subject matter expert on a topic. Um, I may try and influence people through conversations like this um, around tools and resources to create change within their own environments. Um, I will work at different levels. I will try and share what California is doing with the federal level, um, as well as learn from other states uh, and try and apply those lessons learned here in California. We don't have it all figured out in California. We have to stay humble and also acknowledge the tremendous diversity of California. There's counties where we can't say the E word of equity or talk about racial equity. And so finding ways to work with diverse communities to move the needle on the outcomes we care about. Um, I'll partner outside of public health to influence public health through social services and other departments that affect the environment. And um, I will try and support our locals. Since so much of what happens with health is at the local community level, really trying to support community-based organizations with tools and resources and learn from them. Um, and create those bi-directional environments to listen and learn from community. So it's a lot that I do in a day or in a week, um, very diverse engagements and opportunities, um, but ultimately all in the spirit of a California for all, which is improving the outcomes for everyone. And the only thing that I would add is Dr. Radhikrishna is probably one of, I don't know, 30 people in the country that has this kind of job. So he's like very specialized and very unique in his job. Um, the other, I was follow up, what do regular public health officers at the local level do? Um, you know, since you're, you have a 58 county, but what does like a regular public health officer does in the local community? Yeah, great question, Jubin. So thankfully, we've learned that it's not about one person or one office. You can't get by with one health officer or one equity officer. It's a team-based approach. And we have diverse California. You'll have rural health departments with smaller amounts of staff where the health officer may be wearing multiple hats or larger and more urban health departments where the, the public health officer is more specialized. So there is the health and safety code the law of California that it's your job to implement, to create a public environment that is safe for people. And that's promoting healthy restrooms and restaurants and schools and environments and workplaces, and really being the voice and representative for the field of public health. So needing to know some of our core values like primary prevention, like intergenerational life course approaches, not just focusing on the individual, but reminding people that place matters, that we need to address the conditions. <clears throat> you need to be um, a liaison with other sectors because it's many things outside of health and outside of public health that influence public health. So during the pandemic, for example, when I was one of half a dozen deputy health officers, I may be engaging with the education sector or with the workplace and industry sector in order to explain and translate science and data and laws about enforcement or about creating a healthy work environment for workers or for students in the school sector. It's about translating science into guidance and recommendations for the public. And then just, I think one kind of 
fielding off of what you were talking about with public health, could you talk a little bit about um, the role of epidemiology in public health? Yeah, epidemiology, the science of the distribution of disease. There's many subfields now. Um, I'm grateful for a professor at Berkeley I had who taught me about social epidemiology, which is really understanding the distribution according to social factors and drivers. Who gets what, when, where, and why? Um, another mentor told me it's not just about cataloging the carnage. You can have your 100-page PDF reports or your dashboards that shows who's dying from what conditions and what places. It's really about translating that into action to improve the outcomes, uh, to level the playing field, to get rid of that zip code effect. Um, so epidemiology and having that strong data background is so important, but it's time for action. Um, we don't need to ask a thousand questions to figure out at a more granular level necessarily all the factors and drivers. We know a lot about what we need to do. We need a living wage. We need a house over everyone's head. We need access to food. We need well-paying jobs. We need a diverse workforce. Now, epidemiology can be a powerful tool to drill into the inequities. When you disaggregate data, you look under the hood. We see that um, life expectancy in California in 2023, over the past two years during the pandemic dropped by several years. And epidemiology helps us tell the story that it wasn't equal. For some communities, life expectancy dropped by two years, others up to almost five years. And so we wanna drill down into those communities. Even if you look at Asian Pacific Islanders, it's not some umbrella term. There's dozens of languages, races, and sub-ethnicities within API. We need to know the differential impact on Guamanians versus Samoans or on um, Taiwanese versus Hmong. Uh, it's really important to be able to disaggregate data on our dashboards to do the work, to know where to prioritize the resources, and epidemiologists can help us do that. We have two last questions, if, if we can go through those. Um, we have somebody who is post back, who's coming back to a health career, and they just want to know how, if you have any um, recommendations for prioritizing experiences, work experience, school, and interviews. I know um, you had a, a different road to medicine, so they're just wondering if you have any advice on balancing all of that. Yeah, great question, and I I'm, I'm applaud your path. There is no right path. Um, there, there's so many ways as long as you, again, stay true to your, your values and, and your passion and find that sweet spot. Um, you know, we have a lot of things to tend to. We, we are we're caregivers for people in our family. Um, we have hobbies and passions and, and other things, partners, pets, things we need to tend to. And so keep it sustainable. Don't try to do everything at once. Um, uh, spend enough time going deep too. It's not about stacking your resume with five things that you did for a couple weeks or a couple months. Stick with a few things so you can really form relationships and learn over time. Some of those longitudinal threads kind of keep the fabric strong when we're weaving. So I encourage you to do that. Um, and, and again, Talk to people that are a few years ahead of you that have also taken diverse but similar paths to hear from them about the various pros and cons. Um, but you can do several of the things simultaneously. It's not always an either or or linear. Um, we're, we're not in this but world. We're in this and world. Um, and that can feel overwhelming. So pace yourself and keep it sustainable. And then our last question is from a student who is interested in health economics and lowering the cost of healthcare. Do you have any advice on departments or organizations that they should reach out to? Yes, we need you. We will be hiring our first ever health economist at the California Department of Public Health, where we have almost 4,000 staff. So we're going to need you in the future, no matter what field you go into, modeling, return on investment. Um, even shifting the narrative from some of these zero-sum game competitive economic concepts to notions of shared prosperity. When we all do better, we all do better. But being able to prove that, when we have new budget initiatives, being able to model out the impact on gains over different time horizons is so important. And so I'm sure your local health department would love that background to be able to model out some of their various initiatives 
Um, and so you can study, you know, modeling and um, health economics virtually or in person, take some classes in it. You could reach out to researchers in your community or that are part of the institutions you belong in to volunteer or be an intern or join on an existing research project. There's think tanks like the RAND uh, Institute and others across California, the Public Health Institute um, that do a variety of work. So don't just think traditional public health or academia. There's philanthropy, there's the nonprofit sector as well, um, that different pieces of the puzzle like health economics could offer you opportunities to learn more and contribute. Well, thank you. Um, I know that 